The first question, dear Giga Terra, you know uh, where that comes from, that when you are ordained for 10 years in Theravada, you've called, you're called a Terra. So a Terra is anyone who's more than 10 years as a monk. If you're more than 20 years as a monk, you're called Mahatera. If it's 30 years as a monk, actually you're not called anything, but I thought, well, why not call it Megatera? <laughs> and 40 years, Gigatera. And, and I've now been a monk for 49 years. Next year, I'm 50 years as a monk, this is my ordination as a monk, so that's called Terra Terra. <laughs> so at the moment you're Giga Terra. Thank you very much for the profound jokes. The reason why you tell funny stories and jokes, I mentioned this to someone today, is that when a person is laughing, they have their mouth open. And that's the opportunity you can put in the pill of the Dhamma. <laughs> because the mouth is open. I find watching the breath is 99.9% .9 boring. How can I watch my breath without getting bored? Thank you, Ajahn. This is something which I promised I would talk about, usually I'll talk about it later. But nevertheless, when your mindfulness starts to increase in power, what you see, you can see much more, see more detail. Even the, the wood on the floor in front of you, you can see much more detail in that. There are times when your mindfulness really increases in power. So when you go outside, you see any garden, any flower, any piece of grass, and it's absolutely astounding. Sometimes you see monks and they're just staring at a small uh, little bush. They can see so much in it. The reason is because it's like your mindfulness is becoming free of defilements and you can see beautifully and perfectly. My first meditation retreat, which I did as a student many years ago, uh, was in Cambridge where I studied and we were allowed to go for a walk in the morning for an hour before breakfast. Because I knew that area, I was a student at Cambridge, so I went for a walk to the Cambridge Botanical Gardens. When I got into the Cambridge Botanical Gardens, there was a back entrance, so it was nice and quiet. There was a clump of bamboo, and it was the most beautiful clump of bamboo I've ever seen in my life. It was stunning. And of course, you know now that often people paint clumps of bamboo in watercolours because you know, they've got a natural beauty to them. Just they're very thin and they bend under their own weight in these beautiful curves. And even the leaves are just quite refined. The whole thing about bamboo, it's not a strong image, it's very, very refined, uh, in my even called tentative, and very beautiful. When I saw that clump of bamboo, I was stunned by it. I just stood there with my, I think I probably had my mouth open, transfixed by the most beautiful clump of bamboo I'd ever seen. But I had enough presence of mind to realize if somebody saw early in the morning a young student staring at a clump of bamboo like that, they'd have probably called the, the medics, and they'd probably put me in uh, a van and take me to the mental hospital. <laughs> it's not something which you do. Now, it's amazing sometimes with uh, doing retreats in the West. I'm just going off on a tangent here, but once there was a family of Sri Lankans and they said, can we just look at your retreat center? It's opposite our monastery. I said, of course you can, but be quiet because there's a retreat on there. 
So the family had one young kid, maybe about seven or eight years of age, and then they took them just to see the retreat center. And then about a quarter of an hour later, they came back. And the kid, seven-year-old kid, insisted on seeing me. He was very agitated. And I asked, what's wrong? And he said, he said, I went to your retreat center. It's been taken over by zombies. <laughs> what do you mean? All these zombies were wearing white and they were walking very slowly, which is what zombies apparently do. He never seen anything like it. And of course that's what people do when they do the slow walking meditation. They walk really slowly. And apparently that's what zombies do. <laughs> so to this day, that slow walking meditation, when everybody does it together, we call that zombie meditation. <laughs> but anyhow, anyhow, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I saw this beautiful clump of bamboo and it was, but I realized if I kept standing like that, you know, people might not understand what I was up to. So there was a bench, I sat on the bench and I just gazed at this beautiful clump of bamboo for about 50 minutes and it was time to actually to get up and go back to the retreat center for the breakfast. For eight of the nine days, I went to that same bench and just stared at the most beautiful clump of bamboo I'd ever seen in my life. It was gorgeous. And then the retreat was over, and so I went back to studies. When you went back to studies, I had a free afternoon, and I thought, I'm going to go and visit the most beautiful clump of bamboo in the world. I got on a bicycle, you know, weaving through the traffic, got to the back of the botanical gardens, all I saw was this dry, desiccated plant which should not have been there. Bamboo doesn't grow well in the English climate. All the beauty had gone. We just left a, a plant which really shouldn't be there. And that stunned me. Where had the beauty gone? That bamboo was beautiful because my mind was very clear and still. You could see the beauty in it. And this was actually quite amazing to see what meditation did to your perception of beauty. Even your food. Penang, do you like food? And I guarantee that if you get a very deep meditation, you're really peaceful, whatever food you eat will taste more delicious than anything you've ever tasted before. That's just the nature, what happens to mindfulness when you're still, it gets power, you can see more. Even one of my favorite poets, William Blake, said in one of his verses, to see a world in a grain of sand, see a heaven in a wild flower. Wild flowers are very small, hold infinity in the palm of your hand, an eternity in an hour. And that was a poet a couple of centuries ago. When I read that, it inspired me. When I meditated, I can understand it. When your mind becomes very clear and peaceful, you can see more deeply than anyone else has seen. You can taste more, you can feel more, and you can know much more deeply. That's what happens. So when it comes to your breathing, I agree that most people, if they haven't got any deep meditation, they'll always say the breath is boring. Just breath going in, breath going out, you've been doing it all your life, so what, big deal. But you'll be surprised that once your mind is peaceful, the breath is gorgeous. You watch it, wow. I never thought it could be as beautiful as that. I never thought it could be so delightful. And as I mentioned, I think this morning, all the breaths you've ever had, there's no two breaths are ever the same. 
And you can see that. This is just what happens. It shows you that you are strengthening your mind enough to get what we call insight. You see deeper and more than anybody else has seen. And if you are in to innovation, at your business or as an engineer or as an inventor, you can imagine what that can do for you. You can see more than anyone else can see. You can invent and see more deeply. And I think I'm not sure if I have, but I often mention uh, the Joseph's and no, not the Joseph's injunction. It was I think George Josephson, yeah. He was a gentleman in Cambridge who um, got a Nobel Prize for understanding quantum tunneling. Now quantum physics is always you know, just really just weird. And he discovered this, got a Nobel Prize for it. That's big time. And he discovered that after emerging from meditation. That's a power that your mind has when you get it still. How many people in Penang has got a Nobel Prize? <laughs> We've got to change that. Get people meditating and it will come. And your breath becomes really interesting. Not boring at all, you can watch it for hours. And I'm not exaggerating. When that comes up, you see the delightful breath. For those of you who know uh, your Buddhism, your meditation, in Anapanasati, that's the fifth and sixth stages of Anapanasati. You're breathing in and out, experiencing pity, this joy, and sukha, happiness. It's, it surprises you, but it's a really fun thing to do. Your breath becomes incredibly beautiful. And that's the nature of it. How to practice walking meditation. Thank you, Ajahn Brahm. How you practice walking meditation, you start walking and then you stop. You get to the end, you turn around and come back again. <laughs> One of the nice things about walking meditation is you don't get anywhere. Where you start, you go to the end of the path and you walk back again, you end up where you began. What's the point of it? The point of it is, how many things in life do you want to get somewhere? It's not a, about getting somewhere, it's about being here. Being more fully where you are. So what does that mean with walking meditation? It means you start you don't go thinking about solving problems in your business or in your life. You are here. What's it like to walk? So you usually keep your attention about two meters in front of you, or body length in front of you. You don't look to the left, you don't look to the right. And then you start moving your feet. Just right now, don't look at your feet. But can you move your right foot? Right now, just move it any old place. How does it feel? How did you do that? All the sensations of moving a foot, you get to know. When you move a foot, does it go, what's the first part of the sole of your feet which leaves the floor first? What's the last part of the sole of your feet which departs from the floor? How do you actually walk? And once you move the foot upwards, does it go straight up? My foot, when it goes up, it goes backwards a little bit. Now when it reaches the proper height, it goes forward in an arc. It doesn't go straight forward. It goes forward in an arc and then it falls on the ground. What part meets the ground first? What part meets the ground last? You start to become aware of what it is like to walk. Then your weight transfers 
from the leg which was still to the foot which has just been moving. And that frees the other foot so it can move forward. You become aware of what it's like to walk. And you don't go slowly, you don't go fast, you just go naturally. And naturally usually becomes very, very slow. When you do this, it's a very beautiful thing to do because it's easy to do. You may have a sore bottom, a sore legs, a sore back when you're doing a sitting meditation all day. You may get dull when you're doing sitting meditation. When you're doing walking meditation, you never get dull because you're actually doing something. And you also get really, really peaceful. When I was a young monk in Bangkok, I always used to do one hour walking meditation in the morning. And they had a big hall in Watsaket where I was ordained. And they, I don't know why they do this in Thailand. They had a grandfather clock in that hall. It was a stupid thing to have if anybody wants to meditate in there. Just about to get enlightened and ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong. <laughs> it's really noisy. But I didn't mind because I knew it was there, but I could actually time it myself. The hall was probably, I don't know, maybe, yeah, maybe a little bit smaller than the width of this room here. And it took me half an hour to get from one end to the other. I'd turn around another half an hour to get back one hour, because you were so mindful, there was so much going on, you couldn't walk fast. And one day I proved to myself just how peaceful I was when I was doing walking meditation in that hall. I was walking, just noticing the, ex the experience of feelings in my feet as the foot moved up and was starting to move forward. And then I heard something very strange. I heard somebody shouting my name, but like a million miles away. Brahma Wang So. That's a full name, not just Ajahn Brahm. Brahma Wang So. It was really weird. And I thought, what the heck is that? So I paid more attention and I realized it was another monk shouting into my ear. <laughs> That's absolutely true. I was so calm and so into the feelings in the feet, the sound had almost disappeared. Well, my one soul. And then I remember, what's he doing shouting in my ear? And the reason was that I was supposed to go to a ceremony and I'd forgotten. He'd been sent to get me. But at least he knew enough about meditation that he kept on shouting and then slowly I turned around. When you're turning your neck and you're very mindful, it's amazing what you see. Just turning your neck, there's so many muscles have to move to turn. It took me about two or three minutes to turn around. And when I turned around, I said, what? <laughs> if you're going in such a low gear, you can't just go up the gears too fast. I tried my very best to come out as quickly as I could, and that was as fast as I could go. I realized from that just how peaceful it had made me doing walking meditation. So see if you can, those of you on this retreat, Try that. There's many places in this compound where you can do walking meditation. And as you do that walking, do it naturally. Don't try to do the slowest walking ever. Just see what happens. And you go slow naturally. And it gets really peaceful, very in your own nice little world. One thing is don't go thinking and planning. Keep your mind quiet and fully aware of the movement in your feet as you're walking. It also helps, I'm glad to see this, you've got your socks off. Please don't wear socks or shoes when you're doing walking meditation. 
it helps when you can feel the contact with your feet on the, the tiles, whatever else you're walking on. Sometimes it's fantastic. I, I've got the feeling of my feet on the wood of this um, platform here. And you get very sensitive to the different sensations you're walking on. It becomes really interesting. You're becoming awake and aware. And it's very beautiful what you're experiencing. So that's the beginnings of how to do walking meditation. Thank you for the question, because I haven't explained that yet. Thank you, Ajahn, for the loving kindness and the Dharma sharing. Hi, oh, you got a question? <laughs> we got a new teacher here. That's, it's okay. The kids are allowed. Thank you for coming. <laughs> no, she's a, she's an Ajahn to be in the future. <laughs> you must work. <laughs> the mind tends to be forgetful. Even though the mind heard such precious teachings and have experienced a little bit of direct understanding, the mind is still forgetful about the practice to purify the mind. May Ajahn please enlighten this mind. How does one be reminded to be mindful consistently at all moments? Thank you. That is not the goal of this part, to be mindful at all moments. That's putting pressure on you. The goal should be to be peaceful. Not mindful, be peaceful. If that's the goal, then sometimes you realize you have to take a rest. When you go to sleep, are you mindful? When you're fast asleep? Make sure your goal is to be peaceful. So that when you're listening to me, the mind is at peace, and then these things can actually go in. The peacefulness is a prerequisite of mindfulness. And it also means that when you go to sleep at night, you're peaceful. Sometimes people don't understand what mindfulness is. I was saying this in one of the interviews. Once there was, I think it was the interview, once there was a very wealthy woman who came to this retreat just for one evening, for the evening talk. And because she was wealthy, she told her the guard at the gate of her house, please be mindful, there are robbers, burglars, many people have had their houses robbed. So I want you to be very aware while I go to Mahinda Rama Meditation Center to listen to the talk tonight. And the guard said, yes, I'm a meditator, I go to retreats, I know how to be mindful. I think I told a story earlier, didn't I? Or was it just on? No, okay. So, <laughs> he said, yes, ma'am. So she came to the talk, she enjoyed it very much. When she got home, she found out the burglars had been into her house. And they stole so much. Can you imagine what she thought about her gatekeeper? You stupid gatekeeper, I've been robbed. You said you were mindful. He said, I was mindful, ma'am. I saw the robbers going in and I noted <laughs> robber going in, robber going in, robber going in. I saw them taking all your jewelry out and I noted jewelry going out, jewelry going out, jewelry going out. I saw them reversing their truck uh, right inside your driveway. Truck going in, truck going in. I saw them putting your safe on the back of the truck. Safe going out, safe going out, safe going out. I was mindful, that's how I've been taught. Is that correct? Of course not. So sometimes if you understand what mindfulness is, it's much more than many of you have been taught. It always comes, if you're mindful, and your goal is not mindfulness but peace, then what will make your life more peaceful? If you see burglars going in the house, you either try and stop them, call the police, or do something to keep your life peaceful and those who employ you to be peaceful. Then you'll be very successful. 
So you're not mindful all the time. You're peaceful all the time. And how you be reminded? You know that when I was a young monk, I heard some very deep teachings from Ajahn Shah. And one of them, just as an example to you, I remember him teaching that his monastery, his forest monastery in the northeast of Thailand, Wat Ba Pong, he said, this was an old mango orchard. And the mango, or mango trees have been planted by the Buddha himself. And I thought, this is crazy. The Buddha never visited um, Thailand. I know enough Buddhist history, that's impossible. But just as, a, as an aside, when I was in Sri Lanka, I think last May or something, when I was in Sri Lanka visiting, there was a big question and answer time. This time was about six or seven thousand people listening. And one of the monks showed me one of the questions. And the question was this. He said, some monks in Sri Lanka have said that the Buddha was born in Sri Lanka. Ajahn Brahm, what do you think about that? And I replied without any hesitation, they are wrong. Everybody knows the Buddha was born in Australia. <laughs> and I got so much laughter from that. Instead of saying, no, you're wrong, I said something even more ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, The Buddha grew a mango orchard in northeast Thailand. It's ridiculous. It's a simile. And he said that now those mango trees, 2,500 years later, are all mature with hundreds, with thousands of the most juiciest, sweetest mangoes ready for eating. But he said, if you try and climb the tree to get a mango, you'll never be able to get one. If you shake the tree, no mango will fall. If you throw a stick up at it, you'll always miss. You'll never get a mango that way. If you get a ladder or a crane, you still won't be able to reach those mangoes. There's only one way, only one way to get the mangoes that were planted by the Buddha. And that way is to sit underneath the mango tree. And when you're perfectly still and you hold out your hand, a mango will fall. That's how Ajahn Chah taught. When I heard it, I thought, this is a crazy man. <laughs> is that possible? If you sit under a mango tree, if a mango falls at all, it will fall more likely on the top of your head, <laughs> not on your hand. And how long would you have to wait? It's crazy. I heard the description, the simile, but I wasn't peaceful, wise enough, developed enough to understand it. I dismissed it. And then years and years later, when my meditation started to develop much more deeply, then it came back to me, Ajahn Chah's simile. And I thought, wow, what a wonderful teaching that was. It was perfect. At the time, I couldn't understand it. But I never forgot it. It lodged into my mind, ready, waiting for the time when my meditation developed so I could understand it. And at the time, it was real. He actually said that. But very few people understood it, so it was never translated. So in one of my books, I thought, I'd better translate this so I could share it with others. 
Even if you don't understand it, that's not the point. Even I've said it now, and it will lodge in your subconscious, if you like, waiting for the time you get some really deep meditation, and you understand how beautiful and how truthful that teaching is. When you're really still, open your hand means your kindness. That's also very important to getting wisdom and stillness. And when that happens, it's amazing things drop from the trees planted by the Buddha. Incredible deep meditations, bliss out, insights and understanding, wisdom you never thought was possible. It just comes to you, it falls off the tree, but only when you're still and kind. Is there any difference between screening from head to toe and back to breathing? Back to breathing as toe to head and back to the breathing. Thank you for your guidance. You can do whatever you want, but what's nice is you just do that uh, scanning. I prefer scanning from toe to head simply because when you're going from toe to head, in your legs, there's nothing really important going on, unless you've had bad injuries to your toes and your feet and your legs. It means you can actually build up the power of your awareness, so that when you get to your body, it's amazing just what's going on in there. I teach this to people with cancer. And they, they used to call it the Cancer Support Association, now they call it Solaris. It was a big complex uh, which is there for anybody who is suffering from cancers. What can you do about your own cancer? Chemotherapy, radiation therapy, that's one way. That's pretty radical and it really hurts. Can you do anything else? Of course you can. When you get to be mindful of your body, you understand it, you're aware of it. Like I'm just saying like breast cancer. When you get to that part of your body, you can feel, even before a doctor diagnoses, that there's something happening there which is not usual. And if you can give that part of your body lots of kindness, it's amazing just how you can basically vanish those tumours away. This is, I've been amazed just how this thing works. I'm going to tell a personal story that one of the problems a monk has is we don't know what we eat. Sometimes you tell us, but sometimes you, know, you add something else in which I haven't eaten before. And sometimes one of the problems monks get is food poisoning. I travel to so many different countries, so many different cuisines, and sometimes people put some food in my bowl and say, I made this specially for you, Ajahn Brah. It's good for you. It may be good for you, but it may be not so good for me. But I eat it anyway, and often you get tummy ache. Sometimes worse than that, on this occasion I had food poisoning, real food poisoning. I live in a cave, some of you have seen my cave, it's got two doors, so I can't hear anything outside. I do that for some solitude. But sometimes I can't hear anything outside, and people outside can't hear anything inside, which is a problem sometimes. On this occasion, I had food poisoning. And if you've ever had food poisoning, you have these stomach cramps. Just involuntary, the stomach just gets very tight and it really hurts. Inside my cave, ah! It's involuntary screaming. And then, you know, it would go away. And then the tummy would cramp up again, ah! When it happened five or six times, ah! <laughs> and I also like telling this story because it wakes people up, ah! <laughs> ah! 
<laughs> so, so then, what to do? I had a choice. I could actually crawl outside my cave and just call an ambulance and they would take me to a hospital and do something or other. I thought, no, come on. Let's do something else. Meditate. And this is what the meditation was. And I just was so inspired by this. It worked brilliantly. Instead of trying to get rid of that, those cramps and spasms in my stomach or intestines, wherever it was, I was just accepted them, embraced them, welcomed them, not fighting them, but understanding them. When I accepted them and felt them, you can feel they had a beginning, and they built up very quickly, ah! and then they faded away again. First of all, when you get to know them, you're not so afraid of them. You don't tense up so much. And the cramp, it was discernible that it was less intense. And I was also giving it a lot of kindness as well. Poor old tummy, it's not your fault. There's something inside there which is not the donor's fault either. They, for them it was a nice meal, but in, for me it didn't work. And so, little by little, the cramps got less intense. And it took around 30 minutes, and the cramps got so weak that I could see the last one. And it never cramped up again. I never need to take any medication. I never needed to see a doctor. The whole stomach um, cramps totally vanished. And I, even I get amazed at how beautiful the stomach of the Buddha is. There was real stomach cramps, unendurable, and now they totally vanished. And sometimes I wonder, how could that be? Because the stomach cramps, is there's some bacteria in some of that food, and it was multiplying in my stomach. What happened to that bacteria? How could it just suddenly become quiet? And so I started imagining the last time I saw bacteria, you know, through a microscope or a photo, a little blob with all these tentacles. And so I imagined, that those bacteria, all the bacteria, those little blobs with the tentacles, all the tentacles were cross-legged in meditation. <laughs> which, was, which was why the bacteria was calm and peaceful and caused me no problem. That's probably totally ridiculous, but you know, I was happy that the, all the pain had disappeared. So that's when you get to understand your body, you get to be aware of it and know the power of kindness. It is amazing what you can do for your own physical health. That's why I told Chao Po, because he's always concerned about my health and well-being, especially COVID time, especially my age, especially my size. I jump around. We want you to come here next year, or the next year, and the year afterwards. Ajahn Brahm, please be healthy. Don't do much exercise. What I do do is lots of meditation. You can feel your body. It's worked for me so well over so many years. You can sometimes see sort of the start of diseases, the start of problems. And you zap it with loving kindness in your own body, and you can feel it relax, and the body heals itself in an amazing way. Sometimes it stuns me how powerful this is. So that's why doing the scanning of the body is very useful. First of all, mainly to actually to get this mindfulness and kindness started, but also to relax your body, to get to know it, because you've got to live with this body for so many more years. Dear Ajahn Brahm, I experience calmness and stillness. My breath disappears and no thoughts came in. Wow, great. 
After coming out of my meditation, my mindfulness became automatic. I can't progress further because of my fear of jhana and death. How do I overcome it? You've got far enough. My goodness, when I was reading that out, I thought, wow, if only everybody could get to that stage. You know, your calmness and stillness, your breath disappeared, no thoughts came in. And after coming out of my meditation, my mindfulness became automatic. I can't progress further. Why do you want so much? That's pretty good. So be satisfied with that. When you're satisfied with that, then your meditation will progress. One of the biggest problems for meditation is wanting something. When you want something more, you cannot enjoy what you already have. That's a little saying I thought was just so powerful. When you want something more, you can't enjoy what you already have. So this is enough to enjoy. If you want something more, you cannot value this. But then, when you give up that wanting, the power of the mind will take you deeper. Your fear of jhana and death. Okay, that's good enough. <coughs> That's why the very first talk I gave on the first day here about please don't fear things like jhanas. My goodness, they were some of the best things you could possibly experience. Really makes your mind very powerful, incredibly enjoyable. And if you have a jhana, and afterwards when you come out you may have some sort of cancer or disease, just no look at that part of the body, you know, which has got some tumor in it, and zap the tumor away. You think I'm making these things up? There was this one gentleman. He wasn't even a Buddhist. He came on one of the retreats which I led over in Sydney. And the reason why he came on the retreat, he wasn't a Buddhist. His doctors had given up on him. He had cancer, he was dying, there was nothing more they could do. So he tried a meditation retreat. And the very first day on that retreat, I got so many questions which were identical. They weren't questions, they were almost like complaints. Ajahn Brahm, can you please tell everybody to breathe quietly when we're meditating? Because this gentleman was breathing very loudly. <gasps> and I explained to everybody who was on this retreat that that poor man, who's maybe about 40 or 50, had a big tumor in his sinuses. He could not breathe through his nose. He was dying. And that's why he had to breathe through his mouth very loudly. I was very proud of all the people on that retreat. As soon as they were told why, they never complained again. And they gave this gentleman just so much loving kindness. Imagine that was you. You found out that somebody in this audience had been told by their doctors there's nothing more you can do to get prepared for dying. And so instead he came on this retreat and everybody else gave him full support. Nine day retreat. At the end of the nine days, no improvement. Still breathing through his mouth. Still the tumor was very strong. But then I was leaving the retreat center I was actually in the car, ready to go to Sydney Airport, to go back to Perth. And he came running after me, shouting, I jump up, I jump up, stop! And then so I stopped the car, I told the driver to stop, got out, what's happened? And he said, the very, very, very last meditation he did, he heard a popping sound. I always remember his words, a popping sound in his nose. And he could breathe through his nose again, but only for one minute. 
it didn't need to force anything, it just happened, totally unexpectedly. He could breathe through his nose for one minute. And imagine how excited that would make him. Something happened, but only for one minute. And after he told me, I said, well, just carry on. And honestly, I thought he'd left it too late. But about six months later, when I was giving a talk in another venue in Sydney, this man came up to me with a big smile on his face and said, do you remember me? Please don't do that to me. <laughs> How many people here? And then when I go to the Singapore, the same number of people in Singapore, the same number of people in Sydney, the same old, all over the place. <laughs> and the reason I say don't say that to me is because I have to be honest. And I said, no, I don't know who the heck you are. <laughs> but fortunately he smiled. And he said, I was that person with the sinus cancer. And I looked at him. You know when people have a cancer and they're close to death, they look so different than when they're healthy and they recover. And so I looked at him and said, are you really? He said, yes. I carried on what you taught me. And the tumour just got less and less, many more pops until I could actually breathe through my nose. And now the tumour is totally gone. I'm in recession. No chemotherapy, no radiation therapy, no surgery. Just carried on doing the meditation. And he said to me, he wasn't a Buddhist before, I actually never said if he was a Buddhist or what he was, but he said, I've dedicated the rest of my life, however many years I have, to teaching other people how to do this meditation. So they too, if they have cancer, can find other ways of dealing with that problem. Imagine how that makes me feel. You taught someone and saved their life in a beautiful way and encourage them to save other people's lives. That's one of the reasons why this meditation is incredibly powerful. And especially if you can get these jhanas. My goodness, if you're afraid of them, it means you don't trust me. I've got a lot of, of mileage teaching all over the world. I'm not a dodgy monk. <laughs> I've got good reputation. And it helps people. Please believe in that. I'm not talking about believing and just giving me thousands of dollars. I don't want that. I just don't want you to be healthy. If you have a jhana, if one is there for you, please take it. And you, you will never ever regret that. Never. The most beautiful thing you can do in many lives. And the power of it is huge. And, you know, what you can do for your own body, what you can share with other people. I don't care if you're Theravada, Mahayana, Vajrayana, or any yana. This is part of the Buddha's teachings. The eighth factor of the Eightfold Path. Samadhi, stillness, jhana. It's beautiful. And you don't have to be a monk or a nun to get jhana. Lay people in the time of the Buddha did jhana, lay people now do jhana. And they will never ever regret it. It changes your life, but for the better, only for the better. Please go for it. I mean, I know, I've known many of you for so many years. And when sometimes you come up to me and say, Oh, okay, sometimes there is a danger. This lady from Kuala Lumpur, years ago on one of my retreats, she was really smart. You know, middle-aged lady, she didn't have any children, had a nice husband. And she was meditating and meditating and meditating, getting nowhere. And the very last meditation she did, on this retreat. She only did this because she had to wait for her taxi to take her from this retreat center to the airport. 
she had what she said an hour to kill please don't say that as a buddhist <laughs> you don't kill anything <laughs> but anyway she had a free hour so she went into the hall meditated by herself and i will never forget that when she came out of that hall i think i was having a coconut juice or something just no drinking by a table she came up to me she was kneeling on the floor her head was up oh Oh, 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 last, oh, 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 <laughs> she was middle-aged, she was gushing, as if you know, a little teenage girl had fallen in love for the first time. <laughs> That's what it looked like. She hadn't fallen in love. She got into a jhana for the first time in her life. Totally unexpected. And she did that, she, she was killing time. She never expected anything. She let go and was so incredibly peaceful. And the joy and the happiness in her, in her was something to behold. For, for her teacher, that was me, it was just so sweet to see how much joy she had got. But the dangerous part of it is that she's now a bhikkhuni. <laughs> <laughs> a, nun, a very wonderful bikini. So there's no problem there. Anyway, I better clear some more questions, otherwise we'll be here all night. Oh yes, so fear of jhanas? Jhanas should not be feared. How can you fear something you haven't experienced? They're gorgeous, they're beautiful. So don't overcome it, just get into a jhana. And once you get into a jhana, one of the byproducts is you lose all fear of death. You can't be afraid of death anymore. I'll explain that another time. What can I do when my partner does not allow us to have arguments? Whenever there is an argument, my partner tends to blame one of us for either not being good enough or does not appreciate the present moment. Even though I have tried to explain that arguments are a natural part of every relationship, the desire for my partner to agree with me leads to more impatience and disagreements. As a result, I tend to get more frustrated I don't like this part of me or relationship either. What can I do to help myself or us about not having arguments? One of the things which I do is give blessings when people get married. And that's one of the things which I tell them. It's the story of the chicken and the duck. How many of you know that story? Few of you do. Doesn't matter if you've heard it before, you're going to hear it again. <laughs> so once upon a time, there was a couple, they'd just been married. And just after lunch, is a beautiful afternoon, so they went for a walk in the park. And as they were walking in the park, they heard this sound. Quack, quack. Quack, quack. And straight away she said to her husband, Oh, can you hear that? That's a chicken. <laughs> and he said, A what? It's a chicken. And he said, Darling, that's not a chicken, that's a duck. It went quack, quack. He said, No, 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 no. I'm sure that was a chicken. It can't be, it's a duck. No, it's a chicken. No, it's a duck. <laughs> they started to have an argument. And he looked at his wife in her eyes. It's a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and then he remembered why he married her. He looked in her eyes held her hand gently and said to her, 
Darling, I think you may be right. That is a chicken. And it went quack quack again. Yeah, it's a chicken. And she said, oh, thank you, darling. And they continued their walk in peace, in harmony and in love. He was very wise. What does it really matter with a chicken or a duck? Is that worth having an argument over? Is that worth having divorce proceedings over? Of course not. What's more important in a relationship? Being right or being in love? <laughs> of course. And anyway, being right. I mean, Ajahn Chah used to tell that story, and I took it on and tell it so often. And I also say that because I've told that so many times, people go on the internet and they sent me an article of this chicken who was orphaned. And because it had no mummy and daddy, the orphaned chicken was brought up by ducks. <laughs> and be, you've got it. That chicken goes quack quack. <laughs> it could have been that chicken. <laughs> so, so, guys, don't always think that your wife must be wrong. Give her the benefit of the doubt and you have a much happier life. <laughs> At other times, arguments, somebody told me that they didn't like having an argument with their partner, so they made this vow that if they had any disagreement, they would look in the calendar to find what the day of the month is. <laughs> If it was an odd day of the month, first, third, fifth, seventh, and so on, then the wife was always be considered to be right. <laughs> On the even days of the month, the husband would always be right. And I explain it to the women that you have more even, more odd days in the year than the men have. <laughs> so you should be happy with that arrangement. And that was going really, really well. Solves all the problems. <laughs> Odd day of the month, the girl is right. Even day of the month, the man is right. But then what happened in Australia, we started to have same-sex marriages. <laughs> <laughs> And <laughs> I couldn't find a solution then. <laughs> On one day of the month, both parties were right. The other days of the month, they were both wrong. <laughs> but anyway, the meaning behind that, look, is it really worthwhile having arguments? Instead of having arguments, you can have discussions. To say, just, well, you know, this is an important part of our relationship together. So let's sit down and discuss. Not discuss like politicians, I'm right, you're wrong. Discuss like human beings and see what solution you can find without hurting anybody. If you have to be right, you will always hurt your partner. If you realize that sometimes you are wrong, then that's fine. How many times have you been wrong? Is there anyone here who's never been wrong? So you all admit that you make mistakes. That means we don't need to argue. We're just honest. And you find solutions. Dear Ajahn Brahm, faith in Buddha Dharma is sometimes a fine line beside ignorance, foolishness. How do we check and balance? 
First of all, faith in the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha, that's why we usually have the three refuges. Please understand what that means, first of all. And then at least you know where you have faith in. Sometimes when you start a religious path, it's like you go to the, the bus stop and you get on a bus, you don't know where it's going to. Why are you Buddhists? Do you want to achieve Nibbana? Do you know what Nibbana is? A lot of people, I ask them, they said, I want to achieve Nibbana. What is Nibbana? I don't know, but I want to achieve it. <laughs> That's dumb, isn't it? <laughs> you know, honestly, me, when I went to Thailand to become a monk, I told all my friends, I was 23, well educated, you know, healthy, and I told all my friends, and the senior people, even the people at the school where I taught for a year. They actually kept the job open for me for when I was going to return. I said, I'll probably be back in three years. I'm going to Thailand to become enlightened. And once I'm enlightened, I'll go back to uh, London and continue my career, find a nice wife and have a family after I'm enlightened. That's how much I understood enlightenment. But when I actually went to Thailand, I think I've shared this story with many people. When I went to Thailand and ordained as, even as a novice monk, and started to shave my hair off and had brown robes, for the first three nights in a row, I'd wake up in the middle of the night with a nightmare. But my nightmare was not what you may expect. My nightmare was that I was a lay person. And I'd open my eyes and see my robes neatly folded by the mattress on the floor. And I would notice, I'm a monk. I've made it. And I would close my eyes and go into a nice, deep, happy sleep. And that kind of told me something which you can't make up something deeply psychological, how much I loved being a monk. And of course, that was 49 years ago. And I've never looked back since that time. So how do we check the balance between faith and wisdom? See if you can keep challenging your faith. What have you got faith in? It is supported by others in some of the teachings. Don't go for teachings from modern teachers like me. Go and see what the Buddha said. And if you have experience like I had, that just simple things like waking up in the middle of the night and being so, so happy that I was a monk, it was reinforcing my faith in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha in such a deep way. And of course, I've been living that life over 49 years now. And the amount of beautiful things which I have seen. I don't, I'm not rich. I don't have any money. I don't have a bank account. I don't have a credit card. I don't have any money. So what am I doing this for? My job satisfaction is just out of this world. You just get one person coming up to you and said, you saved my marriage. Imagine how that feels. You get somebody coming up and said, I tried your meditation and it saved my, my life. I don't have that cancer anymore. It's amazing just what people have told me over these years. The results of this, these teachings are extraordinary. And that gives me that job satisfaction. That means I check my faith with what actually works. So that's how I live. How not to get angry when someone is literally screaming right beside my ear? If they're screaming at you right beside your ear, that means 
that you're probably going to walk in front of a truck or a bus. So listen to them. Don't get angry. <laughs> but if they're really getting angry at you, it means they're crazy. Such anger never really helps at all. It just shows that that person's passions are just not really uh, being wise or being peaceful. You get so much more in life by talking to a people, person with calmness. So if someone is literally screaming right beside my ear, if they do that regularly, then please use earplugs. <laughs> I know that some people have hearing problems and they have the hearing aids. If you do have hearing aids, that can be a great advantage. You can turn it off. <laughs> so I wouldn't get angry. I would have compassion to people screaming at you. They must be suffering so much. So anger isn't the right response, but kindness is. Question. Why always dreaming? Fighting scenario. Is there any relation to the past life? I don't know how old you are. When you are young, many people fear about fighting, especially the males. It's almost in a part of your genes. I don't dream that much, but once I had one of these, they call it nimiters, but it's a complicated nimiter. My complicated nimiter, I was in a contest with a Hindu sadhu and we were flying through the air using our psychic powers and zapping each other. <laughs> you know, this was like supernatural fight. Zap, 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 zap. Because it was my nimitta, of course I won. If it's your dream, how many times are you the loser? The answer is never. You're always the winner in your dreams. That's why they're attractive. In life, it's not like that. <laughs> so is it your past life? No, it's probably just this life. And a fighting scenario, after a while you get bored with those. In fighting, even if you're a winner, you still hurt, you still get bruised and cut. Can Ajahn explain, regard different experiences and phenomena resulting in the process, result, resulting in the process meditation for a beginner? Even if you're a beginner, sometimes because you don't know what you're doing, you don't control so much. And be, if you've been meditating a while and you know what deep meditation is, if you know what it is, you want it again. It's so desirable. Many people, if you get, say, a jhana or nimitta experiences, that's so incredibly delightful, of course you want it again. Until you realize it's the wanting which stops it happening again. So if you have a meditation which is really amazing, if you want it, it will never come. The stillness is because you don't want things. You're peaceful. This is how Ajahn Chah taught. He said, look at the leaves on a tree or on a bush. When the wind is blowing, those leaves move. When the wind stops, those leaves still move. But less and less and less until they lose all their momentum and become perfectly effortlessly still because that's their nature that's the default state when the wind stops stillness happens and he said that's like wanting when your mind wants something you are agitating the mind when you don't want anything at all. You're perfectly happy to be here, wherever here happens to be. 
then the mind becomes more and more still. You're patient enough, you wait long enough, you don't want anything in the whole world. You're content, energy builds up, happiness builds up, mindfulness increases. You just need to be patient. Then the mind enters jhana. You can't stop it, it's nature. It's not your ability. All you can ever do is prevent it or delay it. In the event of meditation, many breath comes in and out, just knowing whether it comes from the abdomen, nose. Can I just tell me detail? You're supposed to be watching your breathing. The Buddha never taught nose meditation. He never taught abdomen meditation. He taught breath meditation. Where you watch the breath doesn't matter as long as you're watching the breath. I was fortunate. My father had asthma. I never had asthma, but I did have hay fever. So for many weeks during the summertime, I could not breathe through my nose. It was clogged up with the result of pollen. So I thought, my goodness, I would only be able to meditate you know, maybe eight, nine months, a year. And then I heard, oh, you can watch the breathing at the abdomen. But by that time I was a young monk. When I watched my abdomen, as a young monk like you here, you're on eight precepts. When I watched my abdomen, it was right next to my tummy, which was hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so that was very unpleasant. And then eventually I realized that the Buddha never told you to watch the abdomen or to watch the nose, but to watch the breath. Even if my nose was blocked, even if I was hungry in my abdomen, I could still breathe. So I just watched the breath, not any part of my body. And that was very helpful for me. Because the point of watching your breath your breath is like a stepping stone in the middle of a river to cross from the five senses in the body to the breath and then from the breath to the world of the mind and the jhanas and limitus. And the breath was very helpful for that. But when I never noted the breath at any part of my body, I just noted the breath going in and going out, I didn't know where. I didn't have to know where. That was very helpful. I could let go of my body much more easily. And the body just vanished. <clears throat> Is it walking meditation important? Can I try and explain the reason? I think I've already answered that in the first question here. Can the deep meditation see or know our past life? Yes because the deep meditations overcome the five hindrances. And if, if any one of you wants to find out your past lives, it's possible, it can be done, it's not that hard. What to do is to make sure you get into a deep meditation. Even limiters are good enough. Jhanas makes it really easy. When you come out from the deep meditations, when the five hindrances are suppressed, you ask yourself, what is my earliest memory? You don't need to ask that in English, in whatever language, it doesn't matter. What is your earliest memory? And if your mind is peaceful enough, mindful enough, an image will come up straight away. And if it comes up, you don't need to think about it, just let it develop. It's revealing what happened in the past. And it's not like a memory, like what you had for, for breakfast this morning. It's a reliving of that experience. You're back there, re-experiencing what it was like to be a baby, 
or a human being in some previous life. And because the five hindrances, especially hindrance number five, doubt is overcome, you know that was you a previous time. One of our meditators, she was from, again, Kuala Lumpur. She tried this, she's a good meditator. And she got this image of her as a baby being breastfed by her mother. She was only a, a young baby and a clear re-experiencing of breastfeeding. The problem was when she looked up at the person breastfeeding her, it looked so different than her mother. And that really concerned her. So she came to see me and said, this is the image I had. That wasn't my mother breastfeeding me. Has, have I been adopted? Was that really my biological mother? I'm really concerned. And so I asked her, well, the only thing you can do is, you know, go and see your mum. And just when she's relaxed, ask her, mum, are you really my mother? Or, or have I been adopted? That's what she did. And her mother was quite shocked. What are you talking about? Of course I was your mother. And then she explained what happened. And instead of the mother being offended, the mother was really interested. So what did that woman look like? Describe her to me. And when this occurs in meditation, your memory of these events is so powerful, you can almost recall them. And so she described this woman breastfeeding her. And the mother replied, oh, that's amazing. When you were born, I hired a wet nurse for you. I never told you that. I don't know how you can even remember that. You were such a young kid at the time. You were a baby. And that's a really, really close description. I can recognize the description by how you described it, of the wet nurse who breastfeeded you when you were really young. It's amazing the truth which comes out when you can remember early life memories or even better, past life memories. That's such a whole subject. I don't know, sort of, we don't have really time for this. Okay. How meditation help in the factors of enlightenment? My goodness, you need the meditation. Otherwise the factors of enlightenment just don't happen. The, what did the Buddha teach? A fold path. He never ever taught a sevenfold path. Eight factors are necessary. And when you miss out any one of those factors, the path doesn't work. How do a lay person practice serious meditation in home with a family member? In your home, see if you can find a room or a corner of a room where you can meditate. And keep that beautiful holy quarter. I know many people here in Malaysia, they have a shrine room, they have a Buddha statue in there. They have one little place where they do chanting and they just, uh, uh, light, they light incense and stuff. Keep that room as your meditation room. Don't do anything else in there. And that's a lovely place. It builds up energy after a while. And you find you can meditate there much more easily than anywhere else. And of course you can do that in your room. Remember that first story I told about Greg? getting into such a deep jhana, they had to take him to hospital. He didn't need to go to hospital because just the wife was overreacted. Is there a meaning in the colors we see during meditation? No. Any color is fine. The only meaning is how bright they are, how sustainable they are. How to do walking meditation, I have said that already. Apart from sitting, are there any other positions we can do to meditate? Lying down, you can do lying down meditation, but if you do lying down meditation, make sure it's in a posture where you don't normally fall asleep. <laughs> and that's actually quite serious, 
because when I go to sleep at night, I usually go to sleep on my right side or my left side. And I've reserved the laying on my back only for meditation. So these days, if I lie on my back, I don't fall asleep. I've been a monk 49 years, I've trained myself. Laying on my back is reserved for meditation. So when my mind sees me lying on my back, it kind of knows I don't want it to go to sleep. It stays awake. On my side, it can go to sleep. So there's many postures for meditation. See if you can make sure that you reserve one lying down posture for meditation and the rest can be for sleep. Can Ajahn please explain how to practice mindfulness during conversation and heated arguments with family members? Goodness gracious. <laughs> mindfulness with conversations. See if you can speak less. Because most of the times we speak, it's, you know, it's rubbish. You don't need to speak a lot. And with conversations with family members, sometimes if it's, say, your mother or father, you can't argue with your parents. So they tell you, we think you should do this. In English, it's nice to answer, yeah, okay. Okay is a wonderful word. It doesn't promise anything. <laughs> and it means you can walk away and your mother and father realize you've heard them. But then you can do something totally different afterwards. So okay is a, <laughs> a really good word. I'm going to get in trouble for this, but I think it's good. <laughs> Don't have heated family arguments. Because as soon as you get heated, you know, you're losing all reason and logic. And you're creating a lot of emotional damage. So try and not get heated arguments. If things do get heated, see if you can walk away. Find an excuse to walk away. While doing sitting meditation on the floor, is it okay for us to use the wall to rest our back? Yes. In my temple in Perth, the seats by the wall are the ones which go first. So you have to get early to get the best seats. <laughs> Save for when sitting on a chair. Can we lean back so the chair supports our back? Yes, you can. Whatever works for you. Experiment, find out what's the best. When Nimitta appears, how do we embrace or react? He's in line. You just let it be. In this moment, if a Nimitta appears, it's usually very enjoyable. Be careful of excitement. As I said today, with Ajahn Chah's simile, the still forest ball, don't be afraid, don't be excited, just watch, otherwise that Nimitta will kind of know you're watching. A nice simile is to imagine those Nimittas to be very shy. If they know you're watching, they'll run away. One of my members over in Perth was a photographer for a newspaper. Nothing usually much happens in Perth. It's not the major city in Australia. But he told me that his editor of this newspaper summoned him to the office and said, the Australian pop star Kylie Minogue was uh, reported to be in the town of Broome. She had some sort of breakdown and she was hiding from everybody there. Can you please go up to check? So it was like an order from his boss. So he went up to Broome, a very beautiful city, and went over the fence into this Cable Beach resort, just crawled through the bushes, exploring, and he said he saw her. The rumor was true. So he got out his photographic equipment. And he said he remembered my teaching on seeing Nimitus. You had to be so calm and don't be excited. He's not usually a paparazzi, but that day he was. And with his camera, he could lift it up. Really mindful. He got the photo, 
It's really cool because Paul uh, Kylie Minogue needed some privacy, but he said that's his job. And he's so excited, he got the photograph of his career as a paparazzi, photographing a famous person in this resort in the north of Western Australia. And he said he could never do that if he hadn't heard those teachings about how to see limitus. I don't know whether I should be proud of telling him that <laughs> or feeling semi-responsible. That's actually how it works. You don't react at all, you don't embrace, you let it be. They're very, very shy. Dear Ajahn, will regret help purify our past karma? No. Because regret is negativity and it will make more bad karma. Acknowledgement is much better than regret. Learning. So why did you do that? And find strategies so you never need to do it again. Then your past karma gets purified. A little bit of regret is okay, but don't overdo the regret part. Will be will being kind to our mind when thoughts arise cause the mind to wander even further. Often the mind wanders so far it will get lost. No. When the mind starts to wander, don't get in, don't get interested in where it's wandering wandering to. Just be kind to it, just like a little child. When a child wanders off somewhere, do you ask it where it went, what it did, why it wandered off? You let the child go, comes back safely, and you're kind to your kid. And that means your kid knows he's got a very safe place in mother's house. And always make sure the kid has lots of nice food and a comfortable place Lots of video games to play, and it wouldn't want to go anywhere, would it? I'm trying to be quick because I'm over time already. Is it advisable to read the suitors during your retreat? What are the pros and cons? If you have a long retreat somewhere, like those range retreats we do for three months, then yes. But if it's just for seven days, it's not really necessary. Because you got all more than enough uh, information from my talks. If you want to get some suitors, fine, but you don't really need to read them. A lot of time, it becomes a distraction for you. When you go home, you can check the suitors. But right now, on the retreat, just enjoy the peace and the quiet. Dear Ajahn, for human rebirth to occur, does the rebirth consciousness to need to enter the womb at the time of conception and fertilization, or can be any subsequent time during the pregnancy? If it's the time of conception fertilization, then the egg and the sperm haven't even met yet. You do need the two to combine. So, you know, you can't really say whether that uh, has actually happened at all yet. So the time of rebirth consciousness entering the womb is after the fertilization has happened. Say that quite quickly, please excuse me. The time is getting a bit late, it's you know, just 25 to, I'm just answering the questions quite quickly, hope you don't mind. Buddhist meditative insight is gained after coming out of the jhana, yes. Or can it be also attained at the Upachara Samadhi before entering the jhana? Yes. But there is two times when there's upachara samadhi, before you enter the jhana and as you come out of the jhana. And quite frankly, if you're that close to a jhana, why a person wouldn't go in makes no sense to me. Now also you realize, yes, that is upachara samadhi, right next door to the jhanas. And there's no barrier between you and the jhanas. So go in. And when you come out, you know that that was an amazing experience. Then the Upachara Samadhi, which lasts 
after the jhana is much more stable and lasts longer. It's nearly always the case that people get the insights after the jhana, not before. Theoretically it's possible, but it's a pretty dumb thing to do. Go into the jhana, come out, and then you get much more powerful upachara. Good evening, Ajahn Brahm. Good evening. <laughs> what is the difference, detachment and letting go? Letting go is something you do almost immediately. Detachment is something which builds up, so you just, you don't need to let go of it because, you know, you let go of it already. Especially in relationships, parents and children. Remember, even if you have a child, you still got responsibilities until that child is old enough to look after itself. But please remember the wisdom of birds. I don't know if you've seen on National Geographic, those mother and father birds, they work so hard feeding their kids. Every worm, every piece of food, they keep feeding these kids, they're ravenous. My mother and father hardly sleep. But when the birds are big enough to look after themselves, what does a mummy and father bird do? They kick them out of the nest, now you look after yourself, we're going off. Does that happen in Malaysia when your children have finished university? No, they keep sponging off you for, for years and years and years. <laughs> So it should really be the case that parents become a bit wiser and then if at all possible, once the kids have just graduated, they're living there independent, please let them be independent. Husband and wife, detachment and letting go. If you've got a partner in life, you always say that if you're married, you should never think of yourself you should never think of your partner. Who should you think of? Us. You're in this together. You're like an elephant with four legs. <laughs> Who is the front legs of the elephant? Husband, yes. But in Malaysia, elephants walk backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's enough. Is it okay to carry on? It's 22 now. I'm happy. Yeah. Sorry? Enough. Who thinks it's enough? Put your hand up. <laughs> right. Who thinks we should go on? Okay, you have voted. What is the difference in it? <laughs> What is the difference in indulging in bodily pleasure versus food pleasure? Does the bodily pleasure carry more bad karma than food pleasure? Thanks for your advice, Ajahn. This is something which I had to deal with for so many years. That there was no real bodily pleasure in meditation, but food pleasure. Why is it I had disgusting food for so many years? And because it was disgusting food, you tended to get sick. Now I'm like the abbot of a monastery. I try and make sure the food is clean, healthy, and what the monks like. You know the reason why? Because you contemplated, if you like the food, then what's your favorite food? If you think about it now, Saliva will come out of your mouth. You know, the bile and other things which digest that food will get secreted from those organs. If the food isn't delicious, you tend not to digest it. It's just simple health. And I learned that from the Zen monastery, a Heiji monastery over in Japan that they were such an ascetic monastery, except for the food. They made sure the food was always delicious. Everything else, they get up at four o'clock in the morning, 
They would wash in water which was close to freezing. They would work really hard. They sit meditation. If they started nodding, they'd get hit on the back with a Zen stick. Really ascetic, but the food was always delicious. They said, because otherwise you get sick. So food pleasure is not just for the pleasure of eating, it's so you can digest. Nothing to do with karma, just the cause and effect of having a healthy body. In my meditation experiences I have seen bright white light with silver lining, sometimes beautiful golden light, sometimes sunset brightness. These are the common experiences I read or heard before. However, there are a few instances I heard a beautiful drop of water. It was so clear that I thought there was a leakage somewhere outside. I looked outside the room but no leakage. It came again during meditation. Then only I realized it's coming from inside. Is this another type of nimitta? If it is, what am I supposed to do? The problem with like sound nimittas, like a drop of water, is it just comes and goes by itself so quickly. Usually if it's a sound nimitta, it's something really beautiful like an orchestra playing, or like a bell humming, something which is very profound and lasts a long time. One of the things you will notice with the light limiters, the colors become something which are totally unworldly. A white which is whiter than any white you've ever seen in your life, and that's clearly uh, perceived. Yellows which are deeper yellow than any yellow you've ever seen. If it sounds, a sound which is more beautiful than any sound from any orchestra or any uh, any musical instruments you've ever heard. That is one of the important reasons why you know that's a limiter. It's absolutely gorgeous. Most people, 99% of the time, they experience the, the visual limiters. The reason is because we depend upon sight more than anything else. In my passport, they don't have a recording of my voice. They have a picture of my face. That's how I recognize when I go through the immigration in Penang Airport. Not what I sound like, what I look like. The vision is the dominant sense of modern people. If that happens, or what do you do? Just enjoy it, leave it alone, see what happens. How do you develop endless amount of patience and perseverance in dealing with people and in your spiritual practice? I'm an expert in that. <laughs> Look what I deal with. <laughs> How you deal with it? With, with compassion, with kindness. That's why a lot of you I've made friends with over so many years. And that friendship, that kindness, that gentleness, Sometimes I can wear myself out, but you're important to me, each one of you. When I see you, I look at you, you are the most important person in the world, because you're in front of me. Now is the only time I have, and I do my best to be kind. Emperor's three questions. When I read that years ago, I realized how important that was, and that's how I live my life. Now is the only time I ever have. The ones in front of me are the most important in the whole world. And I do my best to try and be kind. Maybe the last one. I haven't finished, but I don't think I can. At times I don't do body filtering screening. Instead I listen to my outbreath and observe my in-out breathing and it brings me to stillness. Great. Is this okay? Yes. Will this method stop me from going into jhana one day? No. <laughs> I'm being honest with you. So I'll do another question. What does it mean when you say someone is a good meditator? You're all good meditators. I'm encouraging you. If you feel you're a bad meditator, you can't meditate, then that negativity stops you. 
I don't know why so many people have a bad understanding about themselves. They're always saying, I can't do this, I'm hopeless, I can't do it. Yes, you can. That's one thing which I really liked about President Obama. Yes, you can. It's amazing when you encourage and you have faith in that. It's amazing what you can do. Can one be a good meditator if not established in sila? If you're a good meditator, then the sila comes afterwards. You become wise enough, clear enough to see the importance of sila. Why on earth would you want to hurt somebody? Why would you want to lie to anybody? Why would you want to take alcohol or steal? It makes absolutely no sense. As a good meditator, you can see this, the obvious reasons why you should keep five precepts. The Ajahn, you said that when a person dies, their mind consciousness continues into the next life. Does this mean that consciousness is eternal? No. If not, what is internal in us? I will tell you in tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so thank you for listening. There are still a few questions here, so we'll do it tomorrow. What is eternal? Always more questions. Okay, thank you all. Now we can just do three sadhus and then we can either go to bed or carry on meditating here, whatever you need to do. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. <laughs> okay, good night everybody, and for those not on the retreat, thank you for coming.